All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Round. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Cordell from the Department of Pediatric Gastroenterology. Dr. Cordell received his medical training at Washington University Medical School in St. Louis, residency with the United States Air Force, and fellowship training in gastroenterology at St. Louis Children's Hospital. He served for five years of the San Antonio National Military Pediatric Consortium Residency Program. That is a long mouthful. And, and after that time, joined Dr. Hart here as one as a second pediatric gastroenterologist. He has a special interest in short gut syndrome and currently also uh, lends his time as the elective director for residents and students for gastroenterology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Cordell. Good morning. It's nice to see faces. Um, the last time I gave a lecture was sitting in my office, which was beyond weird. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about celiac disease. Um, uh, of celiac disease, this is something you're going to see. This is something that's going to be the, uh, something that you have to interact with. And so I came up with some vignettes to um, walk us through this disorder of things that actually have happened, things that have actually questions that have come into my office and some questions that I had, and hopefully um, you will gain some practical knowledge as well. So I don't have any disclosures, and um, so what we're going to talk about today is mostly just about how to understand the changing face of celiac disease based on how it was presenting uh, 20, 30 years ago when I was in training as compared to now, and then recognizing um, the kind of the people groups, the people that have risk factors, um, how celiac disease develops, um, how to diagnose it, and then how to manage these patients. So if you fall asleep after this moment, I want you to remember these things. So um, in order to make the diagnosis of celiac disease, <coughs> the person has to be on gluten, which is the wheat protein, throughout the whole time of diagnosis. If you see somebody and you take them off gluten and you send them to us, you fail. So um, you failed the patient, and so you do your patient a disservice, and it makes them uh, have a very difficult time in making the diagnosis. The second thing I want you to learn is that celiac is singular. Uh, you don't get a touch of celiacs. So to get us started, uh, let's pretend that you, I got this picture off the internet, so I had to make up a story around it, but it's hard to find a picture of the celiac disease that uh, I and maybe um, Dr. Lazagasti, maybe Dr. Guerin saw 20, 30 years ago um, as compared to the ones that we see today. So this is a picture of a child, uh, I think, from Mexico. So let's pretend that you're on a humanitarian assignment and this is your day in the clinic. And you see this child, a uh, very nice young man, and you get a history. He's the smallest in his class. He's clingy to his mom and kind of whiny. Um, He's got daily bloating, and you can um, see that evidently in, as you look at him. He has gas frequently, and he has large, loose stools, about only about two per day, and he bruises easily. So you can observe these things just in this um, uh, physical exam that you can have right now. Number one, you can see he's up against a growth curve, and so that's trying to show you that he's, under, he's short for um, his age. Um, he has a protuberant abdomen, as you can see, he's bloating. Uh, his sub-Q tissue, if you can look carefully here, he has some tenting of that. You can see he's barely, his diaper is barely fitting him. And uh, he's got kind of a forlorn expression. He's sad, um, and uh, so that's his clinical pr uh, presentation. You get some labs, you notice that he has his uh, INR is elevated. He has a, a low hemoglobin low vitamin D, his albumin is also low. Uh, so you happen to have um, full functioning lab, and so you send, uh, certainly you're gonna send for a parasite uh, and infectious etiologies. You might think about milk allergy, you might think about uh, uh, tropical sprue, but um, you also send celiac disease specific antibodies, and you get this panel. And you can see that he has a normal immunoglobulin A, uh, his diamidated ligandin peptide, uh, both IgG and IgA are both elevated, as are his tissue transglutaminase. 
So these are all elevated. So then you, sent, you actually have the ability to do endoscopy. So you go and you do a scope. Now this is just for point of comparison. This is a normal uh, uh, intestinal biopsy that's been nicely arranged on the slide so that you can see the villi elongated. What you don't see in the, uh, in the uh, tips of the villi are lots of blue cells, the lots of lymphocytes. You don't see those. You see normal enterocytes. These are goblet cells. Also, you see a nice normal uh, villus to crypt um, ratio. It should be two to one, and you can see that that's nice and normal. This is our patient, whom we will affectionately name Juanito. Um, is has um, this type of an appearance. And what you see missing is uh, the <coughs> absence of those villi. You see total flattening of the, of the lining. This is total villus atrophy. You also see these uh, crypts are huge. They're elongated. And the third thing you see is all these cells. This is an old slide, obviously, because the, the stain is faded. But you can see all these lymphocytes filling this area almost like a sea of, of white blood cells. So this picture of um, diarrhea, malabsorption, short stature, um, and multiple labs positive, and total villus atrophy is what we call classic celiac disease, the, the kind of celiac disease that I saw in the 90s. And um, now is very rare, very rare for us to see it, but probably as rare as it was then, but it's been eclipsed by all the other types of celiac which we see, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. So first, how do we think about celiac disease? What's the definition of it um, as we think about classic versus now, and what are the definitions of celiac disease and what we're trying to diagnose? So this is a quote from a, uh, a textbook. It says, celiac disease is an immune-mediated enteropathy triggered by the ingestion of gluten in genetically susceptible individuals. So you have to be a person who's born with the capability to be celiac, uh, have celiac disease, and then you have, um, you have to be exposed to gluten, so there's a combination of those things. So just a little history, so you can see how it was learned, what was learned from it. So Aridius, um, oh, where did he go? There he is. Um, so Aridius, this is a Wikipedia picture. So Aridius um, coined the term celiac affection, the Greek word koliakos, uh, uh, who knows how to pronounce that, is Greek for abdomen. Um, in the um, 1800s, Samuel Gee was the first to describe this disorder as celiac disease, borrowing the name from Aridius, and he was convinced that it was related to diet, but unfortunately, his diet was meat and thin bread, so his patients probably didn't do so well. In 1924, uh, a physician named Haas cured children with his banana diet and had people coming to him from all around with celiac disease, because this was, uh, for many people, fatal. In the World War II, a Dutch pediatrician named uh, Willem Dickey, he, uh, during the famine during World War II, noticed that the children with celiac began to improve because they weren't getting bread during the, the war, and his mor the mortality he noticed dropped from 35% to zero. So this was the first that um, bread became, or gluten, became to be recognized as the offending agent in these patients. So fast forward to the present. So in the 1975 in North America, uh, celiac was relatively rare, 0.2% uh, in 20, uh, and now in 2010, it's 1%. And in 1996, the prevalence was one in 3,000, and then just frame shift just a few years, one in 120 to one in 300 in America, North, and, and also in Europe. So why is it? Why is it that it's actually increasing in frequency? Uh, perhaps, but it's also better testing, better awareness of um, perhaps atypical forms of celiac disease. So there's kind of three overall groups. I've introduced you to celiac, uh, to classic celiac, which is like the vignette above, malabsorption, diarrhea, absence of weight gain. But there's now there's more of what we see today, which is non-classic but symptomatic. These are patients who have, might have gastrointestinal symptoms uh, or have extraintestinal symptoms. And then there is a group that is uh, asymptomatic, 
these are members of high-risk groups. Um, or they could be a patient that might have potential celiac. These are people who have positive serologies, but when you bias them are negative and are going to later develop um, celiac disease. Latent is kind of a, a, I introduced this term because you might see it. Latent is a confusing term, but these are patients who you um, don't find it now, but you may find celiac in the future, and these patients are asymptomatic now, but they may uh, have it later. This is the kind of person that you test now is negative and then later um, develop celiac disease. Um, so um, for the non-classic patient, their GI symptoms are like a lot of things you see in the office. Uh, chronic pain, bloating, constipation, uh, vomiting, reflux disease, um, and then even lately, uh, you can even be obese and have celiac disease. So it's not just weight loss or anything. It's a very different picture from the failure to thrive child I introduced you to the beginning. This is more the face of celiac disease that we see today. Um, other, and then uh, outside of the GI tract, there are myriad of other ways that celiac might present. Uh, interestingly, 10% of the patients you might see for short stature are gonna have celiac disease. Uh, delayed puberty, uh, patients who have micronutrient deficiencies. Um, uh, in one series, 35 to 85% of newly diagnosed celiac disease patients were anemic. Um, and of those who were going to be celiac in the future, meaning they had positive antibodies, had a negative biopsy, uh, a, a fifth of those um, were anemic. So refractory anemia might be a sign of celiac disease. Decreased bone mineralization or a patient that um, uh, is having frequent breaks. I saw a young man yesterday who was having frequent stress fractures and was unrelated to his um, present, what he was coming to me for. He's coming to me for burping. But um, I wondered a little bit, so I sent a celiac panel because he was having uh, frequent um, fra uh, fractures. So uh, for uh, women of um, uh, childbearing years, there's a slight increased risk of infertility, and then the newborns that you have may have lower birth weight. Amenorrhea might be seen with uh, celiac disease. Uh, pretty much you're getting the picture that almost anything uh, could be celiac disease, but increased LFTs, interestingly, is high as 9 to 10% uh, in one series. Unexplained elevation of LFTs could be celiac disease um, or related. And then a myriad of neurologic complications. Um, there, uh, has always been a, a concern that maybe autism is connected to gluten um, or ADD, and there are some papers that suggest that there's some connection, but it's certainly not something that you see in everybody or in every person that you take gluten out of their life, they're, um, they're all of a sudden can focus. Here's a picture from, um, uh, from up to date about dental erosions, um, just to remind you that you can see dental changes that could be even evident in celiac disease. This is dermatitis herpetiformis, a rash mostly relegated to adult population. But you can see it's on the uh, extensor surfaces of the um, arms and legs, and uh, is this uh, papulo uh, uh, vesicular type of rash. Um, and its diagnosis is actually made by skin biopsy. And then there are the asymptomatic people. The asymptomatic, we, so we talked about GI symptoms, we talked about the classic, now we're talking about people who are uh, who might have celiac disease in the future or might be uh, asymptomatic. So if your mom or somebody in your family has celiac disease, your risk goes up, up to 5 to 10%. Um, if, if you have type 1 diabetes, your risk is uh, about 10%. Those with celiac disease have a two- to three-fold increased risk of getting uh, type 1 diabetes. Uh, th thyroid disease is associated with celiac disease, IgA deficiency, it's usually about 3 to 5 percent, and then some genetic syndromes, Williams, Downs, uh, Turner's, all about 5 to 10 percent with an incidence of celiac disease in those populations. And then you could have um, a connection with autoimmune hepatitis or even juvenile arthritis. So you can see there's uh, some broad um, um, patient populations that also are at higher risk for celiac disease. So this is shown in this paper. This is uh, um, a series from an Italian gastroenterologist, uh, pediatric gastroenterologist, who moved. He was in two different locations, and his movement um, 
uh, corresponded to two different decades in time. And it shows the uh, changes in the catalog, the type of patients that he was seeing. The black dots are the classic or are typical celiac patients. And you can see that with time, that became less of the dominant uh, type of patients that he saw. And you can see that the atypical, the ones that I've been introducing you to, are the more the common. And this is, this is what we're seeing in practice. This, this slide just shows you that the age of presentation uh, for the atypical has um, reduced. Uh, so this is a, a, a series out of uh, uh, Italy showed that, um, that the, uh, what we're seeing on the surface, the types of patients that are presenting, only represent the tip of the iceberg of all the patients that might have celiac disease. So if you have all these patients who have atypical or asymptomatic types of presentations, then we're only sort of scratching the surface. And for every one patient of, um, that we might see, there might be three to seven out there that have been undiagnosed. And so that's what uh, this is about. So this is the silent form. This is the typical form that we're seeing, atypical. I think this is perhaps even, uh, this slide is even uh, a decade old, might be represented uh, differently today. Okay, so that's uh, a little walk through the different types of celiac disease. So now to kind of talk about um, pathogenesis, this actually true uh, um, vignette. So a new mom comes to you in your well child check um, with her four month old. During the visit, mom informs you that she herself has celiac disease and she has some um, important questions for you. Um, she had the baby by C-section and she's been told or she sees on the internet that it means that her child is at increased risk for celiac disease. She's also heard by, from Dr. Google that breastfeeding is protective. Is that true? And then she was also wanting to um, prevent celiac disease in her child. Or she also heard that there was a, a time that she should um, offer gluten. When was that? And so I had this situation blindsided. You uh, indicate you would like to educate yourself um, first before giving an answer. So you go back and you want to learn more about how celiac comes about. So this is a picture of the uh, wheat family. So um, what you see on this side are the harmless wheats. These do not contain gluten. Uh, on this side, you see rice and oats. So oats are kind of a cousin to um, the uh, uh, gluten-containing uh, variety of grains. So this is barley, rye, and wheat. So these are the ones that are most offensive. Uh, oats, you can see, are a cousin. And we will hopefully have time to talk about um, oats when we're talking about management. So this is a picture of gluten. And the reason I included this is to show you a couple of things. So this is... Uh, Gluten is a combination of two proteins, gluten and then this is gliadin. You can see they fold up onto one another and create this uh, gluten structure. But gliadin is the offending protein, and that's what this picture is to the left. Um, the reason of its problems is it has um, prolamins. Prolamins are prolines that fuse or join with um, glutamine. And you can't see it on this slide because it's too tiny, or at least maybe I can't see it. Maybe you can see it because you have better eyes than I, but all, there's a bunch of P's in here up in the tips of these domains. And these P's are prolines, and they're going to come in and join and fuse a complex with uh, glutamines on another chain, and they're Q's. So um, what that does is it creates a, these prolamins are harmful to the GI tract. They start the process, and the body has... Um, um, trouble handling this. This is going to start a whole cascade of events that have to be present in order for you to have celiac disease. I have two slides that look similar, but they introduce different features that I wanted to introduce to you. So this little banana-shaped or boomerang-shaped thing is gli gliadin, and here it comes down and binds this chemokine receptor, which turns the whole process on. So this is sort of the unlocking the door, and you open this this uh, item here, this protein here called zonulin. Zonulin is released and on the surface here and damages the gut by opening up the tight junctions. So you remember from biology, uh, from, from medical school, that the tight junctions between the enterocytes are what seal our intestines from things leaking in and things getting out. Um, if you don't have good tight junctions, fluid freely flows between, electrolytes freely flows, so that, that tight junction helps maintain electric potential within the enterocyte, helps drive the whole absorptive um, um, process. 
But so this disrupts that, allows proteins to enter, particularly gliadin. So you can see our boomerangs, where is my, here he is. My boomerangs are coming in, and then they're gonna find uh, transglutaminase. You heard that word earlier when I was talking about antibodies. So transglutaminase is there present on the uh, lamina propia side. So non-luminal across the enterocyte, binds the gliadin, and creates a complex. So here's our complex here. And what it's doing is it's changing the, uh, it's deamidating the, glu the gliadin. It's changing its structure, so now it's becoming uh, immunogenic. It brings this over here, and this is what I want to change to this slide, because there's something missing on that other slide. So here we go. We see this is the, um, this is a lymphocyte, actually. So here's our gluten coming across. This is transglutaminase. TG2 stands for transglutaminase. And then I wanted you to notice this, because you can barely see it, but it's HLA, DQ2, and DQ8. These are human leukocyte antigens, um, which help with presenting uh, antigens to T cells. And they are specific. These are a unique type of um, HLA haplotypes. They bind with this complex with the gliadin and then present it to an antigen-presenting cell. This presents it to the T cell and starts the whole process going. They start uh, in, in, in um, stimulating a B cell uh, secretion of antibodies, and this includes tissue transglutaminase, anti-gliadin antibodies, and then it starts um, uh, cytokines, which starts to damage the surface. It starts to um, usher in lymphocytes into the surface, and these start to um, create the mucosal changes that we saw earlier with the inflammatory infiltrates calling lymphocytes to the surface, calling damage. So you can see multiple uh, spots along the pathway that have to be present in order for you to have celiac disease. It's not one thing, typically. But we do see that the HLA part of this is the main thing genetically that's connected to celiac disease. It's, it's not the thing. Twin studies show that identical twins have 70% concordance, so they need something else. So the majority have, get celiac disease if they look identical, but they have to have something else. Interestingly, if you're matched for HLA, there's only 30% concordance. So there's other genes that are involved beyond just HLA, but the HLA plays an important role. You have to have um, these two one of these two haplotypes in order to have a predisposition to celiac disease. Think of them as a marker or, or as a marker of that predisposition. However, a third of the population have DQ2, DQ8. So you can't just go around uh, ordering DQ8, plus it's about $600 a pop for the, for the test. So you can't just order that because you're going to pick up celiac disease or you're going to pick up positives in, thir in a third of the population. Uh, DQ2 accounts for the majority of those, DQ8 or minority. If you have both DQ2 on, on uh, an individual, you have a five, five-fold increased risk of celiac disease. But if you have the absence of those two, you have a greater than a 99% chance that you will not have celiac disease. So remember that fact. So what can we say to this mom? Remember the mom who wants to know all these questions about stuff. So maybe we can send an HLA, right? We send an HLA on your baby, then we'll know. If maybe this baby is negative. We don't have to worry about it. We can feed him all the gluten that he wants. Unfortunately, you check with the insurance. It's not... It's not uh, it's not an indication for getting this test. Remember, it's six hundred dollars. So we have to find out some other information that we can offer for her beyond just that. So now you've learned all the stuff about pathogenesis, and yet you have to figure out some other things to tell this mom. What about C her question about C-section? Well, she's off the hook on this one. Two large population studies in the last decade have showed, uh, with a multinational uh, group, that they looked at two cohorts patients that. Um, had did not have celiac disease and went back and saw which uh, which ones were they enriched with celiac uh, with a C section or not and they showed that the incidence is equal in both groups or no statistical difference between the types so she's off the hook she can get off that guilt train so when should she introduce gluten so this story is kind of interesting actually it starts in Sweden and in Sweden there was an epidemic in the 80s and 90s where they had a sudden upsurge in the numbers of patients of, with celiac disease above what they were normally seeing, and a, about a third of an increase. And so they were wondering, what is this going on? What are we doing differently? And they noticed that there were some changes in the infant feeding um, uh, recommendations during that time. You know how we recommend, hey, start, start solid food now, and we just changed that uh, recently, now that I'm old school um, 
you know, I feel that way because of the new changes. But now it seemed like there might be a window of time that um, was seen with this population where around four to seven months along with breastfeeding your child was important to prevent celiac disease, perhaps. So in, in their study, uh, they showed, they took, picked two groups of populations, one during the epidemic and one after uh, in Sweden. And they noticed in, during the middle of it, uh, one of the groups that they breastfed, this is just average, not everybody breastfed for seven months and stopped. That's not what this is saying. This is sort of the average um, numbers in the population of mothers who had children who went on to have celiac disease. And then they started their gluten a little bit later than the, the other population. So you can see they started at six months, and then there was less of an overlap. Perhaps breastfeeding was protective, maybe. That's was the hypothesis. And then also that maybe gluten should be introduced earlier during the window. And that was seen in the second group, the second cohort, which was later, um, in the, later in the 90s. And you can see that the incidence of celiac disease did, and this is a statistical drop from 29 in 1,000 to 22. And what you see here is that the breastfeeding extends in, uh, longer on average in these people, and then gluten was started earlier. So maybe there is something to this um, window, and this was supported by a, a, an, an American study done in Colorado where they actually showed that maybe there is a window between four and seven months uh, in which gluten should be introduced. But that was a retrospective study, just kind of observational. So to get to drill down on this, um, two, two papers came out uh, from Europe where they um, actually looked at this in a prospective fashion. So they tested 707 infants who were at risk. So they had DQ2 and DQ8 positive. And they mixed them into two groups, with those, and they introduced gluten at six months within that window, and then they introduced gluten at 12 months. And so uh, what, what would they learn? Is there a window or not? And so what they learned was, number one, here are groups. Breastfeeding was the same in all the groups. So those with celiac disease, this is celiac disease autoimmunity, meaning they have positive antibody testing. This is the, uh, my pointer. Where does it go? Here it goes. Uh, this says that they have celiac disease and this is no celiac disease. You can see that breastfeeding was equal in all the groups. And this is a Kaplan-Meier curve showing uh, celiac disease, celiac disease autoimmunity with time. But you can see that early on in the first few years of life, red is group A, the ones that got gluten early uh, at six months. Maybe there was a little bit of an increased amount of celiac early but down the road, the incidence is the same. So it's not really showing here a change or a difference in when you introduce gluten. Moreover, breastfeeding was the same in both. Another um, um, article with some of the same authors looked at a lot of children, so about 450 in each group. And what they did, um, they did this prospectively, randomized controlled, where they offered one group 100 milligrams of modified gluten a day for a two-month window, four to six months, during that window. And then the rest received placebo. What would you expect if you thought there was an optimal window? You should see less people getting celiac disease who got the um, exposure during the window, right? And then what they noticed was that there was uh, no difference. So this is, uh, um, this is every patient. This is girls in this middle um, bar and boys in the lower. So. In this slide, you can see that over time, all three all, uh, lines, so blue is placebo, red is uh, gluten, and you can see that there's no change. There's no difference over time. This slide here is sort of uh, changing the y-axis to show it a little bit better. Maybe there was a slight uh, increase with the gluten group, but that's opposite what you would predict based on your hypothesis, right? That's op if gluten was in an optimal window, you would expect it to be helpful. So maybe, maybe not so much so. And uh, it looks like girls uh, in, their, in this um, population had a little bit, did select out, and the gluten group actually worked to be disfavorable to give it, give it early. And they think that maybe their, the girl group had a lot of um, DQ2 positive people, so that they were at higher risk. So, um, so maybe the optimal window is not true. So, so what can you tell the mom? So go ahead and breastfeed or not breastfeed, whatever works for you. Of course, we're going to encourage breastfeeding, but 
you know, take the guilt off that. She's off the, off the train for the um, C-section, and she can offer gluten now or not, or wait. If you go back to those slides, you can see that maybe if she wants to wait till 12 months, maybe there'll be a later onset for the presentation of the celiac disease, um, uh, perhaps. And maybe that would be helpful. The question that's not answered, what if she never gives the child gluten? We don't know that fully. Certainly, that diet may be, there's some uh, chance that that diet might not be completely complete. You're going to be, in, it's enriched in carbohydrates, uh, may have some minor micronutrient deficiencies within that type of population. So maybe, uh, plus he's going to go to a birthday party and get exposed to kids with cake. You, you, uh, you want to make sure of the diagnosis, but you know, some, she might want to withhold it. Okay. This is a patient you probably saw yesterday. So this is uh, vignette number three. <clears throat> these are not true, these are not actual patients, this is sort of uh, historical fiction. Um, so this is a girl with um, irritable bowel syndrome symptoms and anxiety. So um, so 14 year old, excruciating pain every morning, can't go to school, no nocturnal symptoms, no red flag symptoms, pain is generalized, associated with bloating. Uh, in August, her parents split, as did her boyfriend. And mother is gluten intolerant. Notice that whenever her daughter eats wheat or pasta or uh, wheat products, that her symptoms come up. And so she went ahead and made her gluten free for three months and was seeing how she was going to do. And she felt a little bit better. So, how do we diagnose celiac disease? That's what this sort of vignette is to bring us to, especially someone who's already gluten free. That presents a, a unique challenge for us. So, <clears throat> so we, we talked about symptoms earlier and who we might want to test. So uh, the question, the answer you might think is everyone, but it's not. It's, it's patients who um, might be in the, that non-GI symptom group or those who have um, um, IBS-type symptoms. So diarrhea, pain, poor weight gain, bloating. So that girl would, would be one, but she's gluten-free. Um, what about non-GI symptoms? So you can see uh, some of the things we've already talked about, anemia, short stature, dental changes. Uh, if you were able to see a, a bone densitometry, maybe, uh, and it was decreased, amenorrhea, uh, think about celiac disease, uh, elevation of liver enzymes, remember I mentioned that earlier, and then micronutrient deficiencies. And then in our asymptomatic group, remember these high-risk groups that I mentioned earlier, you might want to test them, and we do. We do screen these patients. If you get a negative test, I didn't make a slide with this, if you get a negative test, when do you test again? Um, probably two to three years would be a reasonable period of time uh, people recommend. And what do we test with? Um, so we test with selective-specific antibodies. There's HLA typing I mentioned earlier, and then there's the small bowel biopsy. So we're going to unpack those for a minute. So in old, um, and you might still see these, uh, celiac disease panels that you get from labs, you might see anticlean antibodies. These are non-sensitive, non-specific tests, and pretty much are no longer relevant. They um, often turn up positive, and we often get referrals um, from patients who are, have celiac disease. The doctor puts them on a gluten-free diet, puts them on the bus, and sends them to us, and, um, and then we have to unpack the, the, what the, was this a positive or not. So tissue transglutaminase, though, is the real deal. So greater than 95% sensitivity and specificity, and the degree of elevation may correlate with um, the degree of um, in, uh, endoscopic changes. The IgA version of that, so TTG IgA, is the most sensitive, and it's alone cost-effective for screening. So if you wanted to send one test, which we recommend, then send an, um, a TTG IgA. The IgG uh, will also be present if you send a celiac panel, but it's not helpful. It's helpful in certain populations, which we'll talk about in a second. But the additional celiac-specific antibodies are deamidated gliadin peptides. This might come across as anti-gliadin and might confuse you. But if you see deamidated on there, that's what is usually what's being tested now. This also has IgG and IgA. It is very sensitive, not as good as TTG. And it's very useful um, for patients who are like two or three years old, actually higher uh, uh, higher use in this population than TTG is, although TTG is still very good. The endometrial antibody should be seen more as a confirmatory test because it's very expensive. It's often included in your celiac panel also, but it's, it's very specific. 
but it uses an expensive cell lines that are difficult to maintain, and uh, so that's why it has um, increased sensitivity, I mean, uh, expense. So because um, both TTG and endometrial antibodies are IgA dependent, you need to make sure there's also not an IgA deficiency. Because if you have an IgA deficiency, you might uh, falsely presume that they're negative. So that's a special situation. And in that case, the IgG becomes relevant. The TTG, but also the, the deaminogliadin uh, peptide. Another special population is what do you do with those mild elevations of TTG? Like the normal in our lab is four. What do you do with eight? Or what do you do with 10 or six? So an e, uh, endometrial antibody could be useful. Uh, one paper said do the EMA later in case the lab mishandled the, the, the specimen and you got somebody else's specimen so you're not sending it. But think about somebody from Taswell. You have to call them back and to do that lab. It's not always practical to do all these in separate visits, but, but that's what's been recommended, to do it at a separate later time as a confirmatory assay. It's probably more cost effective to do it as a chain like that, at least for uh, lab expenses. During that time after you um, have gotten that, if it was negative, if the endometrial antibody is negative, uh, what do we do with that? Maybe this is somebody that's going, maybe you caught it earlier, this is somebody that's going to be that way. Then you might want to increase the amount of gluten that they're receiving over that time and then retest later. So what do we do with patients on the gluten-free diet already, like our patient? So, um, so remember the mom said, she got better whenever she stopped gluten, and uh, roughly, that's about 30% helpful. <laughs> so not usually something that we can really rely on is, is, is our patient experience and what we see, because we're, it's, it's a, that's a subjective issue. So um, that was to show you that you could go ahead and eat all you want while you're waiting to get the test. I forgot about that. So, um, so what do we do with the patient already on gluten-free diet? So um, we're unable to confidently rule out the diagnosis. If the patient feels better, a lot of times they're unwilling to go back onto gluten. They feel much better sometimes, and they do not want to go back. And you talk to them about a gluten challenge, and they're, they're you know, over my dead body, well, I take gluten again. Um, and so if they're unwilling, um, uh, then you can sometimes do a smaller degree challenge, or you could offer them HLA testing. Um, so in light of that, don't put them on a gluten-free diet before they get their formal diagnosis, and that means all the way through endoscopy. It's just a little uh, subtle statement there. That you could send HLA testing. Now, my, my feeling on HLA testing has been too expensive to get, and so I haven't been getting it. But I looked up uh, an, uh, an insurance provider that um, I, I can't say any names, but an insurance provider who um, is relevant to our community. And I looked up, actually was able to find their um, approval for HLA testing. And if you're um, evaluating, look at number two here, evaluating of persons on a gluten-free diet in whom no serologic testing was performed before starting the gluten-free diet. That's our patient. And so you can actually do HLA testing, and then this insurance provider might be able to get it covered. So that's exciting. So that, this would be a time to do that. Um, or if you have somebody who you've done a biopsy on for GI symptoms. They come up with a low level, and I'm gonna to talk to you about what this means, MARSH 1 or 2 in a minute. Um, the low level involvement on a biopsy, and they, um, uh, but their, their, their tests are negative. Then you might use an HLA for that, surprisingly. Uh, they're gonna they're going pay for that. Or if there's a discrepancy between the serology and what you find on biopsy, like, so this is a positive serology, negative biopsy, or um, don't worry about refractory celiac disease, or Down syndrome, and it's complicated with Downs, but interestingly, um, they, their HLA um, markings are so uh, enriched that if you're negative, uh, they're done for life. You don't have to keep drawing their blood. So, um, so then our, we're not able to get HLA. Let's just say their insurance said no. So what, what can we do for this, this person? So we can say, okay, you're, gonna, you're talking about a lifelong illness, and if we don't know, that you have celiac disease, you might be offering yourself or exposing yourself to gluten that might be dangerous to you, might actually cause problems. Uh, and whether or not it's dangerous is something that hopefully we'll have time to talk about later, but um, 
to, to eat gluten after that. I want to get into that. So the formal recommendation has been 10 grams, which is about four slices of wheat bread per day for about six to eight weeks. Um, if you want to really be certain about, um, you know, come up with a, a recommendation, but no one really knows how much gluten you need to take to, in order to really truly make the test positive. Um, one study showed that you can do as much as uh, a half a slice of bread to a slice of bread for two weeks, assess tolerance, and then you can increase, and then at that time there might actually already be damage that you can assess. So this is that MARSH criteria. I was talking about MARSH biopsy. So this is a lot, so we have a patient who's tested positive for their antibodies. We're going to send them to, to one of us, and we're going to do a scope to, to work it out. So this is Mar MARSH zero. So look down here. Here's our criteria. IEL is intraepithelial lymphocytes. So these are the um, little blue things that you see uh, up into these villi. You can see in this slide that there's many more of them filling in here. And I put 25 to 40 <clears throat> as the cutoff because some papers said 25, some said 30, some said 40. So um, just being MARSH-1 alone does not make you have celiac disease. Uh, in fact, 10% of patients with MARSH-1 have celiac disease. So not a common thing. And this is a, bi this is a finding that our pathologists always call, typically. So we get someone that we're sending for abdominal pain, we do a biopsy, they'll come back, and a lot of them have um, intraepithelial lymphocytes. And then we want to look at also the CRIP versus VILUS um, uh, ratio. And you can see that as the, uh, as the CRIP starts to elongate and the VILUS shrink, that, that starts to make a difference here. And that's what MARSH-2 is. You can start to see that how long the depth of these areas are here. It's very blue from all the lymphocytes. And then these three are different amounts of VILUS atrophy, so mild, medium, large, or uh, severe. And that's showing by the schematic. So this is, uh, they're showing you a type four, which is um, the worst, but that's, so type three is total villus atrophy. Um, so that's a marsh biopsy, a marsh scale. <clears throat> so is biopsy always necessary? Certainly it helps to rule out other causes, but sometimes when we biopsy, we, it's patchy involvement. We might miss it. And so what do we do if somebody's got positive serologies and we go in on and miss it, perhaps from a false, from a negative, this might be somebody who is a, is a potential celiac, going to have it in the future, or um, you had a false positive blood testing. It's a very difficult thing. So you want to take a lot of biopsies. I didn't put this on the slide, but you want to take four distal to the ampulla of otter or downstream, and you want to take one or two in the bulb. It's more involvement, um, more proximally, but you want to also connect some downstream. In Europe, they found that if they have TTG greater than 10, times the upper limit of normal. If you have a positive endomedial antibody and you have a positive haplotype, then you can go without a biopsy altogether and your specificity for finding celiac disease is very high. You can go without biopsy. Um, so this is something that we're, that's being recommended in America, probably mostly because this isn't covered uh, regularly for this kind of purpose, just regular um, uh, tr uh, testing. I, ha I can tell you that patients sometimes do not want to get a biopsy and you have to kind of base your your gut, you know, sort of gut feeling on that. So what about other gluten disorders? Are there, uh, could other things be causing this girl's pain? Why did she feel better after she took gluten out of her diet? And so assuming that the patient doesn't have celiac, why is that? Well, there's two other things that could be going on. There's wheat allergy, and so, and then there's non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So wheat allergy, these are d defined more based on time of introduction to time of symptoms. So wheat allergy is more, more immediate, it's an immediate hypersensitivity. You're going to pick it up with IgE testing, which picks up um, more immediate um, uh, hypersensitivity. But if it takes a longer time, that might be more non-celiac gluten sensitivity. What is this? So non-celiac gluten sensitivity is, uh, these are patients typically with IBS who now are taking carbs out of their diet. Um, they're taking fermentable uh, short chain uh, carbs out of their diet, and now they feel better because that's how that's one thing that you can do for your bowel that might make you feel better. So the majority of people who say they're gluten intolerant um, are, are like this, are like this, um, and um, and they can be somewhat militant about this. Um, so uh, and but then the, but in this group, there's probably is a subset of patients who truly are having an immunological thing going on. There may be some people who remember that that slide that I showed you with that was about pathogenesis and that thing that unlocked 
the zonulin and it flipped over it and started to dance, started to, to open the tight junctions. Um, some records think that this is what's happening in non-steliac gluten sensitivity is that it's unlocking, making the gut more permeable, and those people are more prone to gut-related problems. But their biopsies are normal, um, and their blood tests are normal. And this is what's driving gluten, the gluten-free market. And so uh, this is a slide I got offline. This is Statista. If you get two Statista slides, by the way, you have to start paying for it. So um, anyway, so this shows you um, uh, persons without um, with um, gluten uh, intolerance, and then this is undiagnosed celiac disease. This is the orange, and then diagnosed celiac disease. So you can see that uh, in time, people are diagnosing more celiac disease. Uh, those without diagnosed celiac disease is shrinking, but those who just have non-celiac gluten sensitivity is driving the market. And then you can see this is um, Google Trends. So this is people doing Google searches over time about um, gluten or celiac disease. You can see that people really don't care about celiac disease that much, but look at the interest in, uh, in searching about a gluten-free diet. So our last vignette um, is the sullen diabetic. So this is a 13-year-old, um, and I bring this up because I've seen this several times. I get these referrals from endocrinology, and this is uh, a lot of times they are, are will express these sentiments. And so this brings up something I wanted to talk about. So this is uh, a 13-year-old with five years of type 1 diabetes. Their screening is done, reveals an elevated TTGIGA, so in a positive EMA. So you're pretty suspicious that this is going to be a positive. Um, why not just go ahead and put them on a gluten-free diet? Um, well, they're, they're asymptomatic. Both the family and the child do not want a biopsy, nor further testing. They have heard that the diet will make managing their diabetes difficult. I did want to, I'm not going to spend time talking about that. Um, there's, th there's people who say things on both sides of that, that line uh, that we can talk about you know, as time allows. So what do we do with this asymptomatic patient who's in a high-risk group? Um, is testing necessary? Will it make a difference in his life? Really, and with such a hard diet, wouldn't it be better just to wait till they develop symptoms? Uh, what is the value of a gluten-free diet? That's what, I, that's what I'm using this vignette to talk about. What are the benefits of doing that? And there's actually one I didn't put on here, and that's, uh, I said low birth weight infants, but there's also fertility issues too. So that could be an issue for some, for some populations. It's gonna improve your overall growth, um, potentially, not in everybody, might prevent um, micronutrient deficiencies. There might be subtle anemia that this person doesn't realize and that you might help. And then there are some subtle symptoms that often after you put somebody on a gluten-free diet and you come back and ask them later after you've done it, you find that they were actually symptomatic after all. They just didn't realize it quite so much. And those might be some of these dental things, skin findings that were mentioned, uh, uh, fertility, as I mentioned. Um, Fatigue might be something that changes, or their energy level. Uh, that clingy child that I mentioned, so sometimes behavioral changes. You might see uh, people talk about brain fog who have, um, who have celiac disease, and even those who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. They talk about brain fog with, when they're on gluten. Um, I must have eat a lot of gluten. So um, bone mineral density must be uh, also in Greece. So also there's a risk of malignancy, and um, most of these are GI intestinal lymphomas or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, so over a 45-year period, there was a four-fold increase in mortality in all causes arising from malignancies when they followed celiac disease populations. Um, two to three-fold increase of non-Hodgkin's and then a very rare cancer small bowel adenocarcinoma was, was enriched in patients with celiac disease as is esophageal cancer. But there's also another thing. If you, the longer that you're eating gluten and you are at risk, you put yourself at risk for other autoimmune diseases. And so this is a, uh, an older paper that showed, this is from 1999, and what they did was they looked at three different populations. So this is uh, patients with Crohn's disease, celiac disease, and then normal controls. About 1,200 controls, I think they only had 168 Crohn's, and then this was about, I think, 900 patients with, uh, no, 600 patients with celiac disease. And they, they noticed that um, the prevalence of other autoimmune disorders based on the age of diagnosis. So if you were diagnosed early in life versus uh, two to 10 years of age versus greater than 10. But you can see that with age, 
later the age, more prone to having uh, autoimmunity. Many of the patients were already, they were, the celiac disease was diagnosed second. So they were already having uh, autoimmune problems. This is a, just breaking that data down and stratifying it into higher ages, or different ages, and this is greater than 23rd of patients, greater than 20 at risk for autoimmune, um, other autoimmune disorders. This is also seen in this, this is a cumulative risk, this is a different paper, um, with, uh, this is two different populations, some that were adherent to the diet and um, some that were not. And you can see that the, this is the uh, not gluten-free diet, and this is their increased risk percent of patients who have autoimmune disease with time. And th this is months, so, um, so 10 years, a, a good 15, 20% of patients are getting autoimmune problems who didn't take their gluten-free diet. So we've seen that we can counsel this asymptomatic teenager that there is some value in perhaps picking, picking up on your celiac disease. Maybe there is a value for this person that is, who came to us gluten-free already. It's not just something that we can flip off and say, you can just go on without knowing that you have celiac disease or not, because there might be some implications for later in life for their health. So now that they have celiac disease, we're going to... Um, we're going to put in fourth gear, and we're going to rapidly go through um, this. Um, so it's gluten-free for life, but it's very restrictive. So 10 milligrams is like 20 parts per million. This is hardly, this is, you're trying to look at all different types of exposures. You really need a dietitian. You might think that you know celiac disease. You might even have celiac disease, but uh, you really you need a dietitian to be your, your ally in this um, because it, there's actually papers that show that physicians tend to be poor educators in this. And you have to watch out for all different types of exposures. On our, we have a, a bulletin board where people are, um, send cases and stuff back and forth nationally. People are talking about persistent TTG positive people. And one person found that they had dental hardware that had parts per million um, gluten in it. Until they took that hardware out, they finally got the TTG to normalize. I mean, crazy types of restriction. So. This is a mnemonic that, is, that I didn't come up with. Um, so it's consult with a celiac, uh, so it's celiac, see that? And then it's consult with a dietitian, educate about the disease, lifelong adherence to the diet, micronutrient deficiencies as I identify those. A is access them to an advocacy group, and then you need to follow up, continuous long-term follow-up. So what do we do in follow-up? So uh, you're, first you're going to repeat the TTG. It's not perfect. People can um, have normal TTG, actually, who have been on a gluten-free diet, and they still, if you were to go in and biopsy, they're still having issues. So they're not necessarily um, result, uh, is, the, is perfect, but it's all we have. So you can probably do that in about 6 to 12 months. You want to um, assess for clinical response as well. You want to check for micronutrient deficiencies, and then start screening them for auto, other autoimmune things, like we mentioned. Consider a bone density, but this isn't something that we do uh, a lot in children. And then just interestingly, vaccines. So people with celiac disease who, um, who are positive may lose immunity to hepatitis B. So it's important uh, to, to, to assess that. And then maybe uh, some have even suggested that they're hyposplenic and may even need pneumococcal uh, vaccinations. I'll tell you, I have not done that um, uh, with that. So. Um, so, Janie, do I do my questions first? Yes, and then we ask questions from the audience. Okay. So, I didn't, uh, I remembered this morning <laughs> that I didn't put questions in, so I'm sorry. Hopefully, there's no um, um, thought loss here. So, um, so question one, you have a 13-year-old who complains of abdominal pain, diarrhea mixed with constipation, some difficulty with weight gain. She feels better when she removes gluten from the diet. What's the next best step? Okay, so A, start a trial of gluten-free diet for three months and then reassess. Sounds reasonable. So, um, no. So get an uh, upper endoscopy to rule out celiac disease. Um, uh, C, after ascertaining how much gluten she has removed, then send a TTG and IgA. Or D, order a full HLA panel. Or E, all of the above. So what do we ask them? What they answer, I just tell them. So I'm seeing C's. C is the correct answer. It's not E. You're always tempted to say E when it's all above. But A should have sort of warned you that if you put A, then you're out. I, I fail you. So, um, so, so A is wrong. 
and um, don't start them on a gluten-free diet unless the patient is so symptomatic and you live so far away. It's going to be a real and, and we're so booked up. It's three months. You may just tell them you have to give them the caveat that we're going to try this, but you're going to ruin the diet. We're going to ru you're going to delay the diagnosis. So all the following are possible manifestations of celiac disease, except what? So dental erosions, refractory anemia, uh, decreased cholesterol, short stature, amenorrhea. Which one in this one? C. C. Right. C is the right answer. Didn't fool anybody there. And um, so you're trying to counsel a teen about the value of a gluten-free diet for the new celiac diagnosis that they have received. Uh, you might say, and more than one is possible. So A, decreased risk of malignancy. B, uh, improvement in their acne, always important to a teen. C, possible prevention of other autoimmune disorders. D, possible improvement in their adult height. Or E, um, protection against early problems with coronary artery disease. Anything else? Any other answers? So A, C, and D is the answer. I didn't fool anybody. These are easy. So I, online, looks like everybody's doing well also. So sorry I brought us up pretty close to the end here. Uh, but this is pretty good for me. Usually, <laughs> usually I'm well over the time. But um, so I've run through that kind of quickly and probably skipped some things that are relevant to, to others. So are there any questions? So it says, is there a theory about what is causing the increase in atypical MM? Uh, atypical celiac, and is there uh, international data of comparative prevalence by location similar to what is seen in type 1 diabetes? I didn't get into international uh, prevalence, but there is that data. Um, and now I'll answer the other question. So you usually see higher prevalence in northern Europe, Scandinavian countries, some in south. So a lot of, you know, a lot of papers are coming out of Italy, but most of the prevalence is in the UK and in Northern Europe and America. But that is becoming more generalized, and you barely see any in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, India, um, uh, Southern uh, Asia, and, the, and South America. But that's all changing a lot. It's pretty much an international disorder. In fact, I've always taught myself that African American, um, I don't need to test that population as, as, as vigorously, because I send celiac disease panels, I mean, not panels, but TTG on a lot of people. But I diagnosed my first one after 25 years, just a couple couple of months ago, and so I'm changing that thought. But and then the other thought, the other question is, um, the theory about what is causing the increase atypical celiac is because um, probably better testing, and perhaps, um, uh, and because of that, we're picking up people that already had celiac that would have been picked up 20, 30 years ago. We just didn't have good testing, nor were we testing those populations. Um, the other question is, uh, let's see. So, uh, Lori. So then she. Uh, so uh, she says that um, a question came of so why the change in pre presentation since the training, and that sort of reflects that when I was in the 90s, that atypical, we weren't sending this on. We weren't taught to send it on people who came in <coughs> just random abdominal pain. That has changed when TTG came out, which came out roughly the turn of the millennia. Um, we then had a new tool because the gliadin antibodies were just not helpful, and the IgG positive happened a lot. We got a lot of false positives in that. The question says, a high-risk population is tested twice. Are you done? Is that right? No. No, the only way that you're done, and maybe I didn't spell this out as well, is if you do HLA testing. And again, you're going to have an insurance issue unless they are fall into one of those risk populations that I mentioned earlier. Um, so you're probably going to be doing that um, every two or three years. A Downs patient, though, remember, insurance is going to cover that. So you could do an HLA in that population. And I, I don't know about some of the – that was just that one insurance carrier. So HLA is the one that you're one and done. Otherwise, you're going to be screening. So your type, your type ones, HLA testing is not covered because it, there's such an overlap in that population with HLA testing, because both of them are HLA um, associated. And so to do that, uh, it's not going to be covered, so you're going to have to test those people re regularly every two, three years. Is that it? So I'm sorry, the question was, uh, 
uh, an astute question was, should, what should we do about the uh, hepatitis B? Um, do we have to keep testing for that or, or what? And so the answer to that is you test at the beginning. And then once you're gluten-free, um, if they're low, when you test, you have to re-immunize. You do another booster. And then um, after that, once they're gluten-free, they're, 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 they're able to um, mount an immune response. Okay, thanks.